here we are, another Saturday locked down. Let's just give people a few minutes to join the chat. Let's get them on board. Uh, Magalie says she's waiting to be let in. I know Laura's coming on shortly. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, I see people. We've got people still registering now. So yeah, Magali, Joseph, please. Magali, let them in. Um, who else? Magali, and Denise. Denise hasn't logged in yet. I'm waiting for Denise to come through first before I start letting people in. I'm no, no, in. I think let people in now because we want to start on time anyway. So let's just All she right. come on when she when when she got when she sorts it out. Okay, good afternoon everybody, how you doing? Another Saturday during this time of COVID-19. I see that we've got uh, Toby Youssef, we've got Mary B, we've got Joy Adenuga, hello, we've got Any. Uh, I'm usually good at pronouncing names, Ag Agadi, you know. Christel Silas, Yolanda Ferbert, and Liam, Mr. Liam Clark, how you doing? We've got Ruth on the call, etc. So as you know, this is uh, what is our third Saturday now of officially being locked down. And so, sorry, just an early reminder for anyone to uh, just switch off their microphone when they're not speaking, that would really help with our interference on the line. All right, so people, how you doing? Today feels good, it feels good. It feels good to get our special guests on the line today. It feels good to be connected with you guys on the Zoom call. Thank you for registering. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dean from the Elite Vendors Network. And the reason I'm putting together these conferences is to build a community online while we're all stuck indoors. Um, a lot of us um, are still kind of in shell shock or as to what's going on. You know, the this is one of the like first Saturdays really of the wedding season or uh, even if you don't do weddings, you'll be doing other events right now. If you're in the events industry or if you're an events professional entrepreneur, we would usually be doing something today. We would be at an event, we would be at a meeting, we would be um, attending an event maybe as a guest, but we would be out and about. But right now, one of the hottest days of the year so far, we're all stuck indoors for obviously health and safety reasons. And uh, I just wanna let you guys know that, you know, we are still here to support you guys. The Elite Vendors Network is here. Our speakers will come on here today to support you guys, give you some ideas and let you know what's going on for them. And if anyone's got any questions, please get them ready from now. You can raise your hand in the chat. If you wanna ask a question, either Laura or Joseph from the Elite Vendors Network um, leadership team is gonna be on board to uh, you know, kind of acknowledge your questions, respond to you in the chat. The chat can go throughout the whole conversation, but towards the end of the seminar, we're gonna take questions from those who are online. So we have, Four special guest speakers today, um, and they go by the names of Yemi Oka. Oh, sorry, I always sorry, 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 Yemi. Always mess up his name. So we got Yemi Osinkoya from Casiba Bridal. We've got Shola Adedeo from Designer Wedding Planner. We've got Magali Dunkru from Legit Effect, and we've also got Denise Maxwell from uh, Lenzi Photography. So guys, I just want you to just quickly introduce yourself before we get into the questions. Can we start with Magali, please? Can you go first and let everyone know who you are and what it is that you do, please? And remember to unmute your mic if it's not already unmuted. Okay, cool. My name is Magali. I'm an international um, wedding and events planner uh, based in London. And we specialize in destination events, though we do weddings all over the world, including London. Um, so we only do a limited number in the UK. 
um, as for shared it is doing it all over the world. Okay, lovely. Is that, is that not enough? <laughs> no, have you got any more to say? Do like, you let people know some of the countries you've worked in, some of the clients you've worked for? Oh, um, I took I took countries, not clients. Um, so we worked all over Jamaica. We've done. Um, we're supposed to be in Portugal today. Um, we've done Greece. Uh, we've done. We do France a lot. Um, I'm originally. My first language is French. So we do quite a number of things in French speaking countries, Morocco. Um, we do a lot in Morocco. We have an office in Morocco, in Marrakesh. Uh, we also have an office in Paris. So we've got teams a bit scattered all over. Um, we've got a team in Moscow as well, but that's mainly client facing because we do a number of Russian weddings as well. Um, oh, what else? Where have we not done? Um, we do all over, all over Europe, and then we'll go to the Caribbeans and uh, um, UAE and so forth. Okay, perfect. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magali, for joining us. Didn't that froze? <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking the same. Is it Justine? Yeah, it's Justine. Yeah, it's Justine. Oh, Should we move on to the next person? <laughs> <laughs> next person, please. Okay. Um, yeah, Yeni, would you like to go next? You're on mute. You're on mute. Open your mic. Open your mic. Me, yeah, because there's a, there's a presentation I was hoping to do um, that someone is going to help me with. Let me see if I can help with that. Give me one moment. Thank Let you. me see if I can share Yemi's presentation. Thank you. Is that shared? Yes, it is. If you can just. <laughs> So turn the music off. In fact, I don't know how to do that. Let me see. Yeah. So oh, um, yeah. my name is Yemi Oshunkoya, and I'm the designer behind uh, Cosiba. I'm based in New York at the moment, but I have an atelier in London that I normally visit once every eight weeks. In fact, I was there three weeks ago when um, the U.S. president added the U.K. to the banned list for America. So I was meant to come back on a Tuesday. He announced on Saturday and I managed to get a flight to return on Sunday um, because by Monday midnight, um, the U.S. was locked down uh, you know, for people coming from the U.K. Um, I've been in business since 1991 and I specialize in bridal and evening wear. Um, I have... Uh, uh, my silhouette or my selling point is figure enhancement. Um, I try to make, regardless of the size of whoever's wearing my dresses, I try and make them have this hourglass silhouette. Um, but I'm based in New York, so during this meeting, I'll be talking from a New York point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Yemi. Um, I'm going to kind of take over whilst we're getting Dean back on the call. Um, Shola, would you like to go next? Okay. Um, I'm Shola and I'm the CEO of Designer Wedding Planner. I'm often known as the Stylish Wedding Planner. Let me show you some of the work I've done. I started in um, weddings quite by accident. My brother, who's a wedding photographer, actually covered weddings and he used to tell me how some of the wedding planners were not that experienced. I mean, there was one um, wedding that he did. It was an English wedding planner and she was covering a Nigerian wedding. Had lots of people, lots of guests, and there was Nigerian style shouting. Um, this wedding planner actually couldn't handle it and um, she actually ended up hiding in a closet and he had to coax her out and guide her through the rest of the wedding. I love weddings and wedding planning and in general, I've been able to be diverse. I also run several businesses outside of wedding planning. I'm a fully working qualified nurse, midwife, health visitor, health professional. And to me, it's all about proper time management and being passionate about what you do.
Okay. Thank you. Shall That's amazing. Finished? All right. I shall I be finished? Can you guys hear me now? This one's finished. Yes, right. I can hear you. Perfect. I'm back. Thank you for covering, Laura. Guys, I don't know what's going on. Like, my, my Wi-Fi just threw me off. I saw a post yesterday on Instagram, actually, that said, OK, life. I've been given enough lemons now. Like, let's get, let's, let's get you know, because you know that there's that saying, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, yeah? But it's like, I'm getting many, many lemons right now, and we're having to really adjust ourselves and adjust our mindsets, our mentality, and do something with this current situation that we've been um, given. Just before I ask the first question, uh, Denise, I, have you... Yeah, I was just about to say, <laughs> go on, yeah, no, okay. I haven't yet. <laughs> uh, sorry, so, okay, Denise, please, go for it. Okay, everyone. So my name is Denise. Some people will know me as Davina. I'm the owner and lead photographer of Lens Eye Photography. Um, I, special, I don't actually specialise in one particular type of photography. I cover lots of different genres. Um, I like to think it's about creating an image. And if you, know, you, you, know, if you understand shape and form and light, etc., you can create images across lots of different genres. I also think that the fact that, in fact, let me start this presentation. Um, I also think the fact that, um, let me go back to the beginning, sorry about this. I also think the fact that I cover lots of different genres actually helps me in covering weddings um, and other events. So just taking you through some of the types of things I cover. So festivals, um, I'm one of the London Fashion Week photographers. So this is some of my fashion work, sports photography. All of these are images that I've taken on various jobs. I do um, press and photojournalism work, live music work, events. Um, events again, architect architecture and construction. So I cover lots of different types of, of genres. Um, let me stop sharing that a moment. And obviously, as we're, we're here with a group of wedding vendors, I obviously do cover weddings as well. So the furthest I've co covered weddings um, is Rwanda and Nevada. So I do work all over the, all over the world, like many of you as well. Um, I've been a full-time photographer for 10 years now um, and before that I was a part-time photographer like a lot of us kind of doing our passion as well as as well as the thing that kind of brings in the bills um, oh yeah and that's that's my presentation finished so that's just a little bit about me like I said I cover lots of different genres weddings being one of them thank you so much thank you so much Denise um, yes I know you are a lady of multiple talents and multiple hats. I guess I may as well ask uh, you and, Sh and Shola, actually. Um, you know, I know you both to be quite busy people. You know, you're constantly doing multiple things, lots of different work. And, you know, like serial entrepreneurs, that like you, you know, you've got your uh, interest in different things. So at this time, like, what can you advise that, people do to keep themselves busy i've seen a lot of posts on instagram of people saying i'm bored or they got nothing to do or it's just like all the days are rolled into one for me i feel like i've still got loads of stuff to do you know but for people that are just used to having a set routine of a nine to five monday to friday and now they're finding this time a bit tricky what, what would you guys recommend that they can do okay i mean for me, like yourself, I do find it difficult when I do hear people saying they're bored because I think previous to this, nearly every person you speak to will have had some kind of conversation about not having the time to do the things they've wanted to do. So whether that be painting the shed or visiting Nanmore or spending more time with the kids, nearly every person I know has had that type of conversation with me. So to me, this is the time to do those things that we usually don't get the time to do. Um, as a creative, one of the things that I'm doing with my time is just spending more time creating. I think when I was um, doing photography on the side um, and you know I had another, uh, I had a full-time job, um, one of the things that I would do, I'd be, I'd, I'd spend more time experimenting with my photography. Whereas now that it's my job, it, it's actually what pays the bills. So whatever jobs come in are, are the jobs that I cover. So. I've spent more time just doing some of the kind of fun, creative stuff. Um, and if there are people out there that are creative or do want to explore that 
aspect of who they are a bit more, then I'd say spend some of the time doing that. So I know that some other people in the group have also done a don't rush challenge, for example, as just one of them. And I'm sure everybody has seen them going around. So, you know, have some fun with that. I've done one with my nieces. I've done one with my husband. Like, you know, why not spend some of the time doing that creative stuff? Um, business wise as well, this is the time to make sure that your website is as good as you've always wanted it to be, but never had the time to, you know, put that work into it. Um, this is the time to update your leaflets, update your, your contracts, your price plans, all of that as a business. I'm thinking that this is the time for people to do some of those things. So I'd say just use the time for, you know, like I say, we don't usually get this, this, type, this type of time to ourselves, so use that time wisely. And for me, um, what I've been doing is resting. Um, you can't have too much rest to rejuvenate, to reevaluate yourself. Um, I actually managed to get into the garage the other day and I saw um, an adult sized bike, which I hadn't remembered was there. And I thought, hmm, I've never actually learned how to ride a bike. Even as a teenager, as a child, I've never learned how to ride a bike. There's a helmet there, there's some cushions for the um, arm pads and everything there. And I'm thinking possibly, maybe next week, we'll get the bike out and I will take it into the garden and see if I can learn to ride a bike. Can we have some videos as well? <laughs> <laughs> it might not be that graceful to start off with, but I will make sure that I have it <laughs> recorded. So that's on a personal level. Um, but on a business level, I've been going through my emails and I've got emails dating back to God knows when. And it's about clearing out the junk. My, my computer is saying that it's running out of memory. And when I look back, it's got about 57,000 emails. It's about clearing out that junk to be able to have some space to, to, you know, to restart again. But also about being ready. Um, being ready for when this the coronavirus goes away because I believe that lots of the clients that we have or didn't have before are going to realize the value of having a good wedding professional so I believe that we need to be ready for that so I'm going to get my emails cleared up like you said um Denise sort out a new um new leaflet and just sort of try to get ready be sort of one step ahead in getting my business ready so that I'm able to sort of run with it but also be able to have capacity to cope with new new clients okay thank you so much for that um shola for those that don't know i would usually actually call shola mum because she's actually the mother of my fiance my bride-to-be who is uh not getting married today we our wedding was supposed to be today Aww. in portugal and uh, magali was actually supposed to be our wedding planner so she still is our wedding planner but uh, she's not our wedding planner for today. So Magali, let's do some role play right now. You don't have to be that creative because I am your, you know, I am your client anyway. What would you say to me as if I was a bit of a more pessimistic, a bit less of a positive person and a bit down in the dumps about my wedding being today in another country and it not being able to go ahead? Like, What, what would you say to me right now? That's right. um, well, that's a common thing, actually. This is all we've been dealing with right now. We've actually just made ourselves available to hear people cry, scream, shout. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite emotional time. But then I say, do you know what? Um, unfortunately, we can't. It's an unprecedented, unprecedented times. I can't even speak English right now. Um, <laughs> unprecedented. How, <laughs> yeah. Um, however, the only thing in life really that we can really, really, really guarantee is change. So if we adapt our mindset and we understand that we have to be open to it, and as we go in into marriage as well, you're going to find yourself with a lot of things that you didn't plan to experience. So how you handle this as well will show as well the strength of your marriage down the line. So it's okay. We'll get it sorted. We minimize any financial loss if we can actually avoid it then we will and I think that's sort of the case in your case as well um it's where we're we're able to vendors have been quite flexible we've been lucky with having dates and that's been the case with all my weddings apart from the one in the UK which 
and are really annoying because venues are not as flexible as the ones abroad. And, but I've always known this uh, with the UK market. Um, so yes, yeah, just be positive. It's going to be a great day, regardless of what day of the year it'll be. Um, so we're going to have fun and it just gives us more time to prepare for it. And can I speak on that as the potential mother of the bride for t today? In that I was wearing two hats um, in that I thought, do I actually manage this wedding myself or get someone to manage it for us? And I am so glad that I didn't decide to manage <laughs> the wedding because Mag Magalie has been brilliant in this. Um, she's let me be me as the wedding planner, but also let me be me as the mother of the bride. Um, so, and I hope I haven't been <laughs> as awful as some of them. Um, because I've, and also to, to sort of um, counter that, I decided to organise the traditional wedding just so that I could have sort of some say in what happens. So um, that, that helped me a lot. But having said that, at, at the same time, I knew that the main wedding was being handled by a a good professional that was excellent in what she does especially with um, um weddings abroad and knowing the couple as Magali does um it, it really helped me to be so comfortable and i would always recommend even us being professionals not doing it ourselves i wouldn't recommend doing it yourself because when it all came down and the chips were down like with this with the virus i was able to sort of be comfortable knowing that Magali had it handled she knew what she was going to do about it and she knew how to sort of speak to the couple so that I didn't have to. I could still, I could still sort of keep my role as the mother of the bride, potential bride, and sort of let somebody else handle the fallout as well as sort of comforting the, the couple. So that was helpful for me. All right, thank you for that, Shola. All right, so I just want to go over to America right now, to New York City, where um, Yemi is from Kasiba Bridal. And obviously he deals with brides he deals with uh, wedding dresses he designs wedding dresses and there's going to be a lot of brides who are disappointed right now um that their wedding um can't go ahead so um uh, yemi you said earlier that you're kind of uh you said something on the lines of that you're a transformation specialist that you obviously make people look beautiful yeah so how, 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 how in this time are you still making um you know your clients, I guess, feel beautiful, feel positive, and how are you also making your business, I guess, still uh, succeed at this time? Okay, so I guess something that I used to feel a bit um, embarrassed about is actually paying off for me now because I actually have all my equipment at home. Um, in the UK, I have a whole setup, uh, an atelier, but here in the US, I have my cotton table, I have my sewing, my sewing machines here at home. So um, there are some people that their business was interrupted because they literally could not go out to work because they're, they're not essential, or they had a shop that had to be closed, but all my equipment is here, even though I have some machinists that do the work outside of here. So um, in terms of my brides, most of the weddings have been postponed um, or the dates are still far enough that with a bit of optimism, they are hoping that it might still take place at that time. Now, I always add a lot of time to my, you know, when I, ask, when I give the time frame for a dress to be made, I normally put about six to nine months. I pad that time out just in case, you know, not the pandemic, but, you know, I, I pad it out so that we, we are not cut short for any reason. So a lot of my brides are in the stage where they've either done the first or the second prototype fitting, and then I'm in the process of actually making the dress now, or, you know, we're in the stage where they have another fitting to come to. So in the case where we've had the fitting whereby I'm going ahead to make the dress, the dress is being made. So the bride doesn't have to worry. In terms of coming for another fitting or the final fitting, obviously that's going to be um, postponed till we know what's happening. I've just tried to communicate with my bride. Whatever the case, 
I'm here to help you. Don't let the dress be something that's going to cause you anxiety or stress. You know, I'll be as flexible as possible in terms of when every when the on pause button is 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 set, we are good to go, and we'll take it from there. Um, now, New York is uh, is you know it's almost it's the epicenter of the pandemic here in the U.S. and it's like total lockdown, and you know they brought in the cover your you know we have to have face masks. So because I have my equipment at home and I've actually experimented at making face masks, something that I never thought I'll be able to do. But I did it because you literally cannot leave your house without putting one on. Um, I've seen a few people outside that are not wearing it, but you know, I made it out of necessity and I've, I'm giving a few to some friends. I mean, it's something that I might, I might sell, but at the moment I'm still perfecting the, the pattern, etc. So that's what I'm using to, to keep myself busy and also trying to do some more um, courses to do with, um, you know, digital stuff. You know, for example, the presentation I was meant to do today, um, I'm going to actually learn more of that because I realize that we might come to that, and, you know, the questions might come to that, but um, digital, remote, Zoom, webinars, that, that's going to be more common once this is over. Okay, thank you, Yemi. Um, yeah, you mentioned that obviously New York is the epicenter of America um, right now in terms of uh, coronavirus deaths. And that is really sad to hear. And, uh, you know, every, like, we're getting hit with these numbers every day. And it's, it's just sometimes to get gets a bit much, we start not, I guess, valuing uh, each and every life because you know every number we hear is another life but we're hearing 500 people are dying a day a thousand people are dying a day etc um, what's the exact numbers in New York now and uh, why is it so bad there and what are you doing to kind of keep yourself safe okay so New York I don't have the exact numbers for New York right this minute but I think it's I think I think went past the 10,000. Um, I, I don't want to pluck numbers from the air, but the point is the numbers are really leaping up. On a positive note, the number of cases being, um, being positive is sort of leveling down. So, you know, we've seemed to have leveled the curve, but there's always a backlog of deaths, unfortunately. So even though the number of deaths occurring is quite high, but the number of positives is leveling down. Um, and uh, what was the second part of the question, Dean? What am I doing myself to keep safe? Yeah, like why, why is it so bad there? We're, we're, um, okay. There's a lot of stuff online about, you know, it's actually now affecting black people, especially worse in New York. So even if in some cities or states, black people, like 30% of the population, the death toll on them is like, or on us, as you say, is, is 70%. And okay. what are you doing to protect yourself? All right. Now, in terms of Black people and New York being the epicenter, because of JFK and New York is a trap, is an is a, is a international hub. So there were lots of people coming in. It's also very diverse. And once um, the lockdown or people were meant to be social, socially distancing, the essential workers were still going into work. Now, in terms of transport, nursing, care homes, most of the people that work in those industries are black and they were not given enough protective, um, you know, PPE, you know, things to protect themselves with. So the combination of all that is why it seems as if there are more black people, well, it's not it seems that there are more black people according to statistics that are fortunately succumbing to, to COVID. And then there was a time when there was this bizarre rumor that, you know, black people are immune or, you know, that, you know, way back. And I, I think maybe some people didn't take it seriously or, you know, were not as careful as they should have been. So it's a combination of lots of reasons why um, you know, there, there, there are more black people that are succumbing to it. So keeping myself, myself personally, um, 
I am doing the social distancing thing. You know, nobody's coming between, you know, two meters to me unless, you know, we're in the same household regardless. Um, and very early on, there was somebody in my building that was in quarantine even before the lockdown happened. So I was already very conscious. I don't go out of my house without black latex gloves and one of these um, face coverings. And, you know, I just try as much as well and I wash my hands. So I'm, I'm super, super careful. Um, and, you know, thank God I, I haven't succumbed to it. Although the thing is that, you know, the slightest cough I have, um, so the time last week I had a headache, I thought, oh my God, is this it? And that's what is happening, but I just have to keep telling myself that I'm doing all I can to, to prevent it. And, you know, I'm not superhuman. If I do get it, God forbid, I hope I'll be in a position to ride it through. There's no point in being in denial about these things. So that's my attitude for my mental health. Jean, can, I, can I add something to what Yemi yeah. just said as well? Because obviously we've all had conversation. Can you hear me? Yes, yes can yeah, hear you. Yeah. Because obviously we've all had conversations about this. And for me, I think rather than it actually being linked to colour, it's actually linked to class and poverty. So when they're saying that um, more black people have been affected, I think that is linked to, to poverty. So there are some people that they have to go out of their homes, otherwise they're not eating. And for those people, it's a, it may be a choice between staying in your house and starving or going out and putting yourself at risk. So for people that don't have savings, for people who aren't covered by any government assistance, et cetera, for people who, like I say, have jobs where they're carers, where they're cleaners, where they're shop workers, where the people that are actually keeping the country running that are generally on low wages, they have to go out, otherwise they're not going to eat. My friend was um, commissioned to do some documentary work in London the other day. And she said um, she was shooting some police officers, um, as in shoot that kind of shooting. Yeah, she was shooting some police officers, um, <laughs> stopping um, a busker who was in London and he was busking and they were saying to him, look, we, we stopped you yesterday. We told you not supposed to be out here busking. And he was saying to them, I haven't got any money. Universal credit doesn't click in for weeks. I have no savings. I have no money at all. If I don't get some money, I'm not eating. And it's a difficult situation for a lot of people, but that's, that's the reality for, for a lot of people. Not everybody's in a situation where they have savings, where they're getting furlough, where you know, they've got someone to fall back on. So for those people, they're having to go out. So um, like I said, just going back to what Yemi said, I think, I think that the spread is more linked to poverty. Um, I was also talking to one of my brides in Kuwait yesterday, and she was saying that in Kuwait, it's spreading amongst the foreign workers because what happens is people are being brought over from India to build Kuwait up, similar to what happened in Dubai and um, other parts of the UAE. And those workers are generally um, kept, generally kind of live in very small accommodation, many people to a room, shared beds, etc. So the, the concept of self-isolation, it's, it's just not possible. If you're living in a room with 10 other people, you've got nowhere else to go, you can't self-isolate. So again, you know, there's, there's lots of examples that are showing that, that self-isolation is, it's almost like a privilege for people that can afford to do it and are able to do it. So therefore it is spreading amongst poorer communities more. And we know that, you know, often in many countries that there are black communities that are poorer countries. So I think that's how it's linked to colour rather than it being colour, it's actually down to money. Yeah, there's also obviously a higher proportion of minorities in prisons. I think uh, black and Latinos are over 50% in, uh, so make up over 50% of the population in American prisons, etc. And so actually, Denise, I was going to come to you because uh, obviously Yemi's in New York, myself, Magali and Shola are all in London, but you're in the Midlands. I don't really know many people in that part of the UK. So what is happening in, in Birmingham and the Midlands? Like I, I, I'm hearing that the police are being a bit stricter on lockdowns out of London and a bit stricter policing people in general. Do you know what? It's difficult for me to comment because I haven't really been anywhere except for Asda and Poundland. <laughs> so <laughs> I couldn't really, really tell you what's happening. Um, I have been commissioned by one of my news agencies to go and do some documentary work in Birmingham. So that'll be the first time I venture out to Birmingham. But 
other than that, I, I really couldn't tell you beyond my little neighborhood and the walk to Asda, because I have, I have been walking a lot more as well. I, I actually couldn't tell you. I really don't know. Okay. All right. No worries. That's fine. Fair enough. All right. So I'm going to go to a question, because as we know from previous weeks, like this, this session goes really quickly. Yeah. So um, to our resident wedding planners here, but obviously Denise and Yemi, feel free to answer too. Um, we've got a question from Ruth Williams saying, how do you um, stress the urgency to book suppliers from now for a bride that is set to marry at the end of this year due to the current pandemic? Bearing in mind their dates have now become very popular due to couples that have to reschedule their red wedding dates to later in the year. So you guys are like, someone told me before that a wedding planner is like the fairy godmother. People don't often see what they do, but they are very, very much are uh, valued. So at this time, people are going to be leaning on their wedding planner more than ever right now, those that are lucky enough to have them. Yeah. So, but what would you say to someone who just is not seeing the urgency of um, acting now? Well, to start off with, I do think that a lot of it stems from conversation, dialogue, but also being able to stress to your client that listen, this is what's happening, because maybe they're not fully realising what's going on. Um, let them know that because everybody else is postponing their original dates, and we're hoping that the, um, the, the pandemic will cease and go away by um, sort of August, everyone's pushing their weddings that bit later. And so obviously December, from October, November, December is going to be really, really full so that they need to book that date. Otherwise, they are going to lose it. And by booking it, that means putting down their deposit, locking it down. If they haven't done it, then you can ask to do it for them, um, especially if those that couple have given you sort of the, the budget and you're um, sorting out their, their venues and things for them. Then you make sure you put the deposit down, speak to the venue, make sure they've got the date available still because people as we're as we're sitting at home lockdown the phones haven't been locked down so the, all the people that are pushing their dates forward are actually contacting the venues and booking those dates and with their credit card they've locked it in so your client might lose the date if they don't listen to you and that's something that you can actually put into your contract as well you could actually say that the onus of not doing things that they've said they're going to do is up to them and you will not be held responsible for it or you will say that I will do this, 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 and then the onus is on to you to do that and comply with that for them. But if they haven't done it, have a conversation with them, speak to them, let them realize that the dates are gonna be taken and that you will not be held responsible for it and see how it goes from there, Ruth. I will just add that, try and find out why they've been hesitant. Um, Cause I'm finding out that a lot of people, because they're a bit unsure about what's going on now, they're a bit unsure about what's going to go on later on in the year or even in 2021. And just so having those conversations and saying, okay, what well, if you book, this is your guarantee that, you know, if there's a change in the date, if anything like this was to occur again, this is how we're handling it now. Um, it's because I'm finding that a lot of people is just like, well, we don't know, do we? That we, we actually don't know. <laughs> no one really knows. Like, you know, so some, some people are just like, well, if I book it, if I, I've got weddings in September and October and people are like, should we change our dates? And I'm like, no, not for now, but let's just see how it goes. Um, so just try to continue having a conversation with them just to try and understand what, what is holding them back. Um, and also what we found as well is that some vendors are not as open to take some bookings now because they don't know the impact of the current weddings that they have. So they, they're, they're being a bit reluctant with that as well. And that's what we're finding with our 2021 weddings, where they're like, well, a lot of people have given us different dates and we actually don't know where we're going to be. Mm -hmm. So it's just having a conversation with the client and really trying to understand what is going on in their mind. But like you said, Shola, like if, if they're not going to book nothing, it's really, it's nothing that you can do. All you can do is just advise them what to do and to make sure we, we look at ways to protect them should they should their dates have to move but also protecting yourself as well um because yeah, yeah, yeah quite a lot of the clients will say to you but you didn't tell me or you didn't say that i should book it now i've lost my date and then they'll pass it on to you as the wedding planner to sort it out for them no no we will make it clear that no this is this is <laughs> on you <laughs> That's what, we've advised you 
this is and I understand that you've got fears and this is what we're putting in place to make sure that you don't lose your money but you know just be mindful that they you know if you don't book someone else will book those dates okay um by the way I've had a few comments that my lighting is looking a bit crazy and I have to apologize I have to sort this out for next week it can't happen today but you know as I said life is just giving me lots of lemons right now and we're just having to you know make lemonade and talk about making lemonade I want to talk to Yemi because Yemi's been in business longer than all of us yeah he's actually uh, been in business for like 30 years so even though you haven't seen an epidemic a pandemic before in your business or in your lifetime you've been around for a long time so you are very experienced when it comes to survival yeah so what 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 would you say it takes to, because just like Magali said, some people don't even know if their business is going to survive to the end of this, much less trying to take bookings and sort out their calendar. What would you say the mindset needs to be right now, the attitude to making sure that your business gets to the other side of this pandemic? Um, you're still muted, Yemi, you're still muted. I started my business in 1991 and that's when there was a major recession in the UK. Um, and because of that, the government was um, offering free, they were, they were trying to encourage people to be self-employed. Now, I had always planned to be self-employed, but the government was in the process of encouraging people to be self-employed and they were providing things like free um, business courses and things like that. And I took advantage of all those things. And that's why I learned about taxation, marketing, um, PR, just at the point I was starting my business. And that really helped me because that's when they drummed into me that no matter how talented you are, if you, don't, if you don't take care of the business side of things, your business will fail. And that helped me. So I took advantage of a situation. And, you know, if you can start in a recession, the only way you can go is up. So what's happening at the moment the fortunate thing is, is a global thing, and most governments are now trying to have all these things to help. So any grants, any, um, you know, any, any, any way you can get some money to help your business, I hope everybody's applying for those things. And, you know, contacting, I mean, I don't know how many people have um, premises, brick and mortar, you know, things with the business rates. Because even though I'm based here in New York, I still have a premises in the UK. So I'm trying to sort that out to ensure, you know, I take advantage of the business rates holiday and whatever grants, you know, the, the, the um, level that my business is, um, you know, is rated, you know, there's a certain amount of money that can come in. Just try and get everything you can. And then also, now is the time to try to learn new, new things you know, do some courses. I've always wanted to do more um, computer-aided design, things like that. I'm looking into that. Um, but yeah, you just have to take advantage of the situation you find yourself in and just look for anything that people are offering. And then there are also different um, bodies. For example, from a fashion point of view, the British Fashion Council has a grant coming out there might be, um, I don't know, there are lots of wedding planners within our group. There might be something, just keep an eye out for anything that is being offered and take advantage of it. it, it, it all you can do is to apply. You, you might not get it, but at least you've applied. Um, that, that's, that's the advice I can give at the moment. But just, you know, um, try to minimize your outgoings. For example, people that have phones you know if you have a premises that you have a phone line is it possible to contact the um your supplier and say look i'm not in the office the phone is not being used is there a way of you know either shutting things down or putting a pause just just try everything you can to minimize your outgoings and then things you can do maybe um you know everybody's doing you know you're going like instagram is like Everybody's at home. Nobody's going anywhere. So what you want to do, give out some free tips, hints and tips. And then if there's a way you can monetize the details of what you're giving out. So you're, you're being 
um, generous by giving information, that's fine. But then maybe there is the detail of the information you're giving now that can then be monetized. It doesn't have to be a lot of money, but you know, so you can bring something in and minimize your outgoings. I think that's my advice. Okay, thank you. That leads me on to two questions. The first one is for Magali, and the second one is for Denise. So the first question I have for Magali is, uh, you know, Yemi said he started his business in 1991. That means that I was five years old when he first started his business. Bit, by the way, well done, Yemi, and we hope that you see another 30 years in business. Amen. <laughs> well, you know, really well done, seriously. Um, but I know, Magali, you've got actually two children at home that are about that age, you know, it's quite small children. How, you know, I've been getting messages of people telling me that all the days are rolling into one, they don't know what day of the week it is anymore, etc. And obviously you're at home with uh, your two kids who are very young. How are you um, staying in business right now, like as in keeping your mind in business? How are you staying sane and what are you giving them to do every day? That's the first question. And Denise, Yemi spoke about going on IG Live, but obviously IG Live is getting very crowded now. Yeah, so can you give some tips on how to stand out as a, a, as a personality or as a business um, amongst all the noise that's now happening as a photographer? I know you've got a lot of experience in that. So please, Magali, first question. Well, I'm not coping, Dean. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. I won't lie. Um, but we're managing my husband happens to work in education as well so he's a little bit more patient with the kids i'm also eight months pregnant as you know so wow. all of this is just it's a lot it's a lot to deal with but um so we are prioritizing on our existing clients that's what i'm doing so um i've got myself and i've got my assistant claude that is working with me and we're both working from home we work from home anyway so he hasn't really changed anything in terms of that um, so she's, you know, she's dealing with some of the admin stuff. I deal with the more the conversations and just speaking to people. Merci, Emmy. <laughs> um, and um, so that's that's one. So we're still doing our admin as per usual, but our focus is only on our current clients and um, that's who I'm giving all my time to um, so we've got clients all over the world as well. So sometimes the times that they call us is a bit um, it's a bit late. So I have to be available to speak to someone. And if someone wants to call, and it's, this is just because of what's going on, we're having to, to speak to clients at 11 o'clock at night who just needs someone to speak to. So that's my priority right now as a business, which is focused on our current clients. Um, in terms of with the kids, um, we had homeschool and their homeschool is a little bit different from every one of my friends is doing homeschool because they had like online register that they had to register at a certain time. And so we was really working on homeschool from like nine to 3 PM every day. Um, so that wasn't easy. I'm not too sure. I'm trying to figure out what car to buy my son's teachers. Um, because it's, I realized how hard it is to work with kids. Um, but because they are mine um, and my youngest this is very special. Um, that was a um, that was very interesting but they're on holiday now so right now they are um they've gone on a bike ride with their dad hence why it's quiet here um so they've gone for their exercise of the day i love that um but um so it's just yeah keeping them entertained but there's also two of them so they're keeping themselves entertained as well they're both boys um so it's just giving them different things and i've got my mum around as well so they we're just interacting with them and just giving them crafts and, you know, it's just family time, loads of family movie times. Yeah, so you've really got a good um, support system um, there, I'm hearing. Yeah, so, in terms of support system, I'm not doing it on my, on my own. Yeah. Um, and I'm focusing on resting as well. It's just, yeah. you know, preparing okay. for next month. <laughs> I, I actually, I was in Sainsbury's a few weeks ago and I saw a friend from school and she said that she's, uh, got a one bedroom flat and she's got three children in the flat and she's never had a time before where they've all been home at once because one is quite a bit older than the others um what can you say to someone that's in that kind of situation they, not not much of support not in touch with the father of her children and oh. living in a very small space it's difficult but what can you do that's your situation that's where you are 
you know so the the only thing that you can really do is try to see how the older one can help with the youngest one things that you guys can do together um my youngest one is into cooking so all the meals is right there next to me so we all know that that's what exactly that we're working on um so in terms of that that's how that's what i would suggest try to do as much as a family try to take some spaces i try to have my me time so even if i have to lock myself in a bathroom you know regardless of the situation to just try and find your find a balance and she'll be she'll be the best person to know what to do with with them but that's your situation there's no there's nothing else you can do about it it's just you know manage it it's also about acknowledging that she is going through some really difficult times there's no yeah. getting over it because some of us have got a second bedroom that we can go and scream in she hasn't got that so it's about sort of acknowledging that but also you know just telling her that she's doing really well because she might not have heard it that she's doing really well especially in this crisis with all the children under one roof but like Magali said, find something that interests them. And this might be the time where you will have to sort of say, it's okay to look on the television or use the computer because there's so much things out there. I mean, there's timetables and David Wicks. I mean, he, like, um, um, I think Yemi was saying about give something free. David Wicks has given a lot free in this time, you know, like in exercises and things to do with the children that he's, yeah, still, we... yeah, he's given a lot free. Yeah. There's loads of things that that lady can use, even in her one bedroom, but she just has to be creative and build in some time for herself. But I do get it sometimes, it really is. Thank you for that, Shola. And uh, so, Denise, to the question I asked you, I asked you earlier, sorry, about mm -hmm. standing out. Um, I think, obviously, it's going to be different for everybody because everybody has different tactics in, in how they show their work in the first place during any time, not just this time. So some of the things I've seen from other creatives that I've found interesting. So one of my friends is a tailor. Um, and again, he's been in business for about 20 years. So he's been putting up a lot of archives of his first suits. And it's been getting so much kind of interaction because obviously everybody loves a bit of nostalgia, don't they? So he's been putting up click suits and, you know, all those 90s kind of clothes that people used to wear. And it's just been getting loads of interaction from that. So I do find that a lot of people will interact with that type of stuff. Um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, just doing kind of fun and creative things. Um, we did the, a Don't Rush Challenge from a group of UK black female photographers. And what prompted us to do that was that we saw a male photographer's one. So we were like, we can't let them beat us with this. We need to be able to get in on this as well. <laughs> So we did one of those and the interaction on my Instagram has gone up by over a thousand people in one week. It was very good. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, there's lots of different things that we can do like that. But I think one of the important things for me, um, and again, not everybody is very social media orienta orientated, but for me, I do enjoy seeing lots of posting. I do enjoy seeing, seeing older work. I do enjoy seeing archives. Um, and I, and that's just some of the things that I've been doing. I've been doing like fun shoots with my partner. So I don't know if people saw the one that I did. It's on, it's on, on my Instagram feed where I, um, we did a, a picture of us on the first day of lockdown and then a picture of us eight days into lockdown. And the first day we were all loved up and hugging and kissing and whatever. And then by the eighth day, he had a knife and I had a hammer. <laughs> so like we've been I've been doing fun things like that and I've been getting <laughs> I can't hear you Dean I don't think you're saying something no no I said I saw that I saw that it's really funny <laughs> so I've been doing lots of fun things like that as well as posting as I normally do um like I said it, it's difficult for me to to say to all the photographers how to stand out because everybody's unique in what they do anyway but I think the most important thing for me is to, for people to still be consistent in, in what they are posting, to, to kind of not think, okay, we're in lockdown, let's just sit in the garden all day and not do any type of marketing work, which is what your social media is. So for me, it, it's more about that rather than, you know, saying to people, you should post this or you could post that because everybody's so unique in what they choose to post. Didn't it, um, um, Dean, can I, can I just have a few suggestions? Yes, go for it. Yes, okay, so um, I have a strategy that I'm using at the moment. Um, thing is, know your, good, know your strong points, know your weak points. My, my weak point is 
coming live on, on screen and being really spontaneous. However, I've got tons and tons of archive images. But what I'm doing is I'm taking them in different chunks and anybody in a different genre can do this. So what I did the past few days was literally my uh, getting my bride dressed. I attend, a, I dress a lot of my bride. So I'm taking it from literally when I um, record the dress to when they're getting to their car. That's one. And then I'm doing it for all my brides. Before that, I did the first dance. I'm going to, further on, I'm going to do the bride arriving in her car before she walks up the aisle. I'll probably do some in the wet. So, because I know this might take a long time and you have to be consistent and people are there waiting. But if you, rather than just doing the scattergun um, effect, just post, if you can try to be strategic and then that way, you know, you have images that you can use for a long time coming and then just keep doing them. So for example, if I was a wedding planner, uh, maybe I will do some pictures of um, before the venue, because I hope you all do this, before the venue, after the venue, then you can do um, table settings, different table settings. So that's, that will take a few days. You can do the, the look when you bring the bride to the room, the reactions of the bride. So these are just chunks that will take you weeks ahead you know, because at this time, people have to remember you. And also, if you don't post, people might think, oh my God, what's happening with them? Have they given up? Um, and, it, you know, there are some brides that uh, are still going to get married. So you have, this is the time, and everybody's at home. Everybody's on Instagram. So you have to be um, strategic, strategic about it. And then that way, you know that even next week, two weeks, three weeks, there's stuff you're going to post and you already planned how you're going to do it. Yeah, and on a note from what Yemi's saying, I used to rely on the videographer to get me my posts and um, video shots of the uh, various bits of stages of the day. And then when they'd send me their cut, I wouldn't be in it at all. And trying to get your bride or your next bride is to be able to sort of show them that I was there. I was the person that did that wedding. I was the wedding planner for that wedding. So now I've decided that I'm going to be bringing my own videographer photographer to my weddings so that I've got the picture of me or pictures that I want and also it saves having to sort of wait for those photos to be released because I've got my own photographs yeah. having said that again before you post you've got to make sure that it's in your contract you've got to make sure that you've got the client's agreement in your contract before you expose or put those pictures online can I add to that as well, what Shola just said? I think that's really important, Shola, even from a copyright right, right point of view. Because I think, I know that we've had discussions in the group about copyright and who owns what and what who's allowed to post what. But, you know, the safest thing that you can do as any vendor is to have your own imagery so that, you know, you don't come into these problems. Um, even as a photographer, one of the things that I'll also... Um, always speak to other photographers about if I'm teaching or doing workshops etc is again having content of you doing your job because we're really good at capturing other things but very, a lot of photographers are so poor at having captured themselves doing work so for example I was speaking to one of my friends um, just before lockdown bumped into, into, into him on the strand and he used to be um, one of the um, in-house photographers for the British Fashion Council during London Fashion Week. So he used to get to go to all the after parties, all the pre-parties, behind the scenes, backstage, front stage, literally all access all areas. So he's had some amazing, amazing work because he's been able to get access where many other photographers couldn't get access. Um, and... He, he did that for about two years. And then after two years, they just stopped booking him. They started booking another photographer. So I was saying, oh, Nigel, so, you know, you must have like so many memories from, from you know, from that time, etc." And he said, you know what? I only got one photo of myself on a, in a, in a um, just before a catwalk was about to start in all that time. So I was like, you didn't get any selfies with, because he's worked with this model and that model, and loads of famous, but I said, you didn't get any pictures with them all. You didn't get any pictures of, of you in the press pit while you was about to shoot or... And he's like, do you know what? I just absolutely forgot. And that's the thing about, like I say, especially with photographers, that often we're out shooting and we're so great at capturing everybody else's moments, but forget to actually include ourselves in that. And that's something that I'm always conscious of. So again, on my Instagram, um, some of my photographer friends will laugh at this, but I've got a whole section to do with selfies. 
um, on different jobs that, I've, I've, that I've, I've worked on, selfies with celebrities or, um, pub, or public figures, etc. And it's a bit of fun, but at the same time, it's also me showing what I do and showing that I was there and showing that I did take these images. So I think for any vendor, it is important for them to have images videos etc of them doing their job because we are visual people and i think even more so now in social media age people do buy with visuals they do buy with what they see they are led by what they see so you know like i say i think um agreeing with charlotte that that is just so so important to have your own imagery and your own video of doing what you do Yes, actually relating to both what Shola and Denise just said, I have to let everyone know that we are actually recording this session. Yeah, so <laughs> I have to put that disclaimer, we're recording this session for it to go on uh, possibly on social media, on YouTube later. I have to remember to add that to my briefing for uh, next week. Um, but I just wanted to um, actually talk about um, content, all the content that's online right now. And we've had a question from Eni, uh, which is really interesting. So uh, what she's saying is, in this period and beyond, clients have a lot more time on their hands and with information available more readily, uh, so more readily available, as well as resources, many clients um, now have basically a lot of the information that they need to hand. Yeah, so it's quite a long question, but I'm just gonna kind of summarize it. So she's saying that basically a lot of the clients now have or our prospective clients have information to hand. So does that kind of devalue uh, what we do? I guess apart from Yemi, because he still has a physical product. And, um, but I guess for, for the wedding planner, for the wedding planners and for the photographers, do you, do you see technology kind of basically eventually eradicating what you do i'll answer that quickly from myself as as a, as a ex dj still dj a bit sometimes people were saying to me from about 10 years ago that technology is gonna wipe out the dj basically but i don't think you can ever take away that personal touch yeah so you can uh, uh, for now until the robots get as clever as us mm -hmm. i don't think any of the machines are going to be able to have that uh, human interaction so to be able to look at a crowd and say okay well this song's not working um, I'm going to move on to the next track or I'm going to cut this one short I'm going to play this one for 30 seconds I'm going to play the next one for five minutes because it's a great song and everyone wants to hear the whole thing I don't think at the moment technology can do that but there may be a time that it can do that but I still I think it'll be a long long time before the actual physical DJ is eradicated uh, for the wedding planners what do you think about this? I can answer that um, in relation to wedding planning, and, and we all know that it's an easy entry role. Anybody can be a wedding planner, especially after they've done their own wedding. They feel that they can be a wedding planner. But nobody can actually stand there um, and sort of say, I can actually mitigate against certain circumstances. For example, I was um, covering a wedding and she was just about to come. It was in, in one of the domes, one of these beautiful domes with a huge layering in. And um, she was just about to make her grand entrance. Um, everybody was standing up and I was sort of encouraged her to come in. And um, the wedding cake, which was made with real fresh cream, just went onto the floor. And, and I knew that she, she, this was her prized, part of her prized um, wedding things that she'd had. So I took the, one of the napkins, scooped the cake that was on the floor, put it towards the back and just carried on smiling. And when she danced in and she sort of danced past her cake, she sort of looked and I was there to be able to say, carry on dancing, carry on dancing, it's okay. And, and then she went to the front and she sat down and then um, I said, the cake's just fallen, but everything is fine. So I don't think you can replicate that um, anywhere else than having a real person, but also having a person with experience. Um, so people might say that because they've sat at home and they've done an online course that they can now be a wedding planner. I mean, wedding planners are like air hostesses. When we're greeting the relatives that they come in, we've all got our high heels on, our lipstick on, and we're saying, welcome, come in, and all the rest of it. But then when we get down to the nitty gritty, we've got our flat shoes on, we're running up and down. And I mean, an example is um, one marley bone, where you have an upstairs and a downstairs, and quite often it is full. And having to run up and down and make sure that everything is covered with your team, it's not easy. So letting the brides know that it's wedding planning, anybody can do it. 
but nobody has that kind of experience to mitigate is quite important. So I don't think they can get rid of wedding planners. Yeah, I'll add to that. I think my thing is, um, so I'm understanding that the majority of people on this call are wedding vendors. So I feel like if my clients, for some strange reason, felt that I could be replaced by technology, then I haven't done my job properly. Um, so because I feel that um, at the end of the day, um, we focus, even in the way that we do our business, we tend to focus on word of mouth, people that have seen us in action and understand that we are irreplaceable. We, we are, I mean, our focus is always on the clients and on the events itself and creating unforgettable experiences. You're not gonna get that by Googling what to do and everything else. You can use the same venue, you could use some of the same vendors and you won't come up to the same results. And so for me, it's that we need to make sure that in our service that we provide on the day and even just the journey of it, that we, that, that's where we shine. So that, that thought can't even enter my mind. I can't even imagine one of my clients thinking that um, we could be replaced. You know, some of, our, some of our clients celebrate their first year anniversary with us because they feel like it's weird that we're not there on the anniversary date. So I think what we need to do is just to make sure that as service providers, that we actually add an extra to it. And if, so that it's not a question that um, a, a wedding planner, it's a luxury item, but it's an essential element of a successful night or a successful experience because you're not gonna get this again. So I think we need to just make sure that when we are providing our service, that our service stands out and that it's, it's a thing on its own that we, you know, we can't do this without. Sure. You and know. I mean, for example, can I, can I, I, mean, I, I think I take a totally different attitude. I'm really surprised the person you spoke to said that because in my opinion, when this is over, the wedding planners are going to be key because combination of leading up to the wedding and on the day coordination, dealing with vendors, Juggling dates? No, I, I take the to I take the totally different opinion that wedding planners um, are going to be one of the the most important elements of of a wedding because no bride is going to want to to have to deal with what's happening now and brides that haven't even got to that stage will think, oh my goodness, if this was if this was happening to me, how would I cope by myself? So no, I take a totally different view. Mm -hmm. I think wedding, um, in, as I said last week, wedding insurance wedding planners uh, and contracts. Those are the three things that are going to be king when this is all over, mark my words. Yeah, I mean, for example, um, the day before lockdown, um, I, my bride that is getting married in July had her wedding dress um, fitting. And I was in two minds whether to go because COVID-19, do I go, don't I go? And um, because we hadn't had the lockdown yet, so I went there with my mask and I went to um, Ivory and Blush actually um, in South Kensington. And um, she was there, we kept our distance and she was trying her dress on and everything. And um, she actually said, I'm really pleased that you are here with me. So I don't really, I don't think you can get that with taking um, a computer with you because it was a real person. I was able to share that moment with her when she tried her dress on. And we tried not to hug, we were doing air hugs all the way through. And then when we left the shop, we didn't even realize when we both sort of hugged because it was such an emotional moment for her. And then I spent the next seven days sitting in isolation thinking, oh my God, COVID-19, oh my God. But it was okay. But it's just that that personal touch, like Magli said, it's the personal touch. You can't, you can't get that from a computer and you can't get that from a person who hasn't got the experience to share it with you, but let you be yourself at the same time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Denise, do you want to quickly touch on that before yeah, I finish? I think um, in terms of photography, um, there, are, there have always been people who do value photography and people that don't. Um, and I don't know if, I don't know if that will, if that will be a change afterwards. There are still going to be people who do value a quality photographer as well as people that don't. So I, I think it will be much of the same for, for our profession. Um, so there are, there are people that, that, you know, you do see in groups and online chats and stuff that talk about, oh yeah, my uncle's going to bring his camera and he's going to take the photos for us 
or you know my, my 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 niece is really keen in photography and i think she'll be able to take the photos for us there are still going to be those people afterwards and there are still going to be people that value a photographer and everything that they bring with all the experience they bring just the same as what Shola is saying I think with any quality vendor, it is not just the service that they're providing, but it's all, it's all the add-ons, it's all the peripherals. So it's the fact that, you know, as a female wedding photographer, I know there have been times when I've had to be helping a bride into a dress because everybody else is busy and there's been no one else available to, to help, it, help her to do that. And it's got to be done. So I've had to put my camera down for a couple of minutes and help her into a dress. So, you know, I think it's all those peripherals that, that, you, that you provide if you are a, a knowledgeable vendor and an experienced vendor um, that, that, you know, people who recognised it before will recognise it even more. So, like I said, I think it'll be much of, much of the same. But one of the things I do think will happen is I think that, that people are going to be a lot more conscious about how much they're spending. So... Um, I think that people that we're going to see weddings that are maybe smaller. I think we're going to see weddings that are much more considered over what they spend their money on. So if you are a photographer, you better be a very good photographer because, you know, you are going to get grilled on, you know, what they're spending with you. Are they going to be getting, getting value for money in terms of what they're spending on you? The same for a dress designer, the same for, um, a, events organization i think it's going to be the same with everything that people are going to be very very conscious of what they spend their money on i think even if we think about it from our own personal point of views um i know that already i'm thinking to myself do i really need to have that subscription or do i really need to such and such do i need to upgrade the car at the moment like all of these things i think that i wouldn't have thought about so so um, I wouldn't have thought about it in such a laboured way previously. I, I know that I will think about it even more after we come out of this. I mean, at the moment, while we're in this, I'm, I'm not considering buying a lens cap at the moment. So <laughs> I'm sure that <laughs> when we come out of the other end, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about, you know, what I do spend my money on a lot more carefully. So I think that will be the change for us in weddings that we'll see smaller, we'll see a lot less people kind of just inviting people just for the sake of their my dad's granddad's best friends, uncles, cats, owner from 10 years ago kind of thing. I think we're going to see people, everything get a lot more concise so that people actually, um, yeah, spend a lot more carefully. Thank you for that, Denise. Yes, I myself, I've cut my Amazon Prime. I've kept Netflix. <laughs> Amazon Prime's gone. I've cut <laughs> Dropbox but I kept Google Drive, like, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So I'm not having excess right now. I'm keeping it quite slimline. And I guess that's what um, that question, the original question from Any alluded to. So guys, um, obviously I, I tend to be quite a, a happy, positive and optimistic person. A lot of people that say, you know, I've always got a smile on my face, et cetera. Um, but this is a very serious, um, you know, situation that we've got going on in the world. And like, I'm even getting a little bit upset because, you know, friends of mine have lost f a close family members, you know, like uh, one of my friends lost his grandma. Um, one of my friends, uh, other friends lost her dad. And it is, you know, it feels like it's getting, it feels like it's getting closer to home. So um, Magali, I know you've lost uh, two uncles uh, during this time of, uh, mm -hmm you know, COVID-19, um, how, how, how has it been for you? Because one, of the, what, one, one thing that's in our cultures, I think both African and Caribbean and maybe all cultures is even though we can't necessarily prevent somebody from passing away uh, most of the time, one thing that we do to heal as a community is gather around afterwards. You know, we gather, we, we gather around, we have food together, we play music together, we talk, we celebrate the person, we crack jokes, etc. And that all helps with the healing process. So how, how has it been for you to actually lose family members and during this time and then not be able to actually go and socialise with any of your family? Yeah, it's been really weird, um, to be honest with you, because you the only thing you could do is reach out by phone. Um, but um, 
I think as well, I think when it first happened with my first uncle, and I think I was talking to you about it, and I was just like, we were like, is this, is it really coronavirus? Is it really killing people like this? And I think first realising it, and I think um, as a Congolese as well, it seems to hit the com Congolese community a lot. Um, I think my mum gets a phone call of at least two people a day. And it's just like, what on earth is going on? Um, but yeah, you don't have the other around. And I think some people, um, so a lot of people sort of decided to wait until COVID-19 is done, or the lockdown's down, to sort of gather around and to be there with people. And I know with my cousins, all I could do was just call. But even that, there's only so much you can do, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just try to support people as much as possible. And um, but we feel limited. You feel actually limited. That's the only. That's the honest opinion. I just feel really limited, and and it's still a bit surreal because you haven't gathered around with everyone else, and um, because we don't know what's happening in terms of funerals and and things like that. So I, yeah, yeah, I can tell you a little bit about funerals because um, obviously I, I shoot funerals as well. It's one of the things that I that, that I also shoot. So. At the moment, what the rules are is that um, it's slightly different in different towns, but people are being allowed between six and 10 people to a funeral. So um, one of my granddad's friends has just passed away and he has like, I think they have 10 children, but they also have um, grandchildren, great grandchildren and great greats. So they're having to decide who's going to attend the funeral. I can't mm. imagine, I just can't imagine that situation right now, but that's the reality that people, you know, that's the real kind of decision that people are having to make. I know that what some families have chosen to do, um, and this was something that families also did beforehand as well, is that some families have chosen to, um, say, if, if, for example, if, if 10 is the number, they've chosen to have eight family members and instead have a photographer and videographer to ensure that everything is captured so that everybody else gets to share it. It's not ideal, but under these circumstances, those are the decisions that people are having to make because, you know, it's the option between do you have 10 family members there and everybody else just has kind of phone pictures and phone videos and gets to view it via what everyone else kind of captures in between their grief and in between kind of being part of the funeral, or do you have a couple less and kind of invest in, you know, capturing it to a, a you know, a, at a level where everybody can kind of feel as though they're part of the part of the the event so those are some of the real decisions that people are having to make at the moment and i know that for example in our family funerals are a really big deal as Magal is saying like you know going to the family family's home beforehand um celebrating afterwards you know the, the funeral that, that is, is, is going to be taking place shortly it would have been one of the biggest ones in our in our town because this family is a very very well-known family very big in the church one of the first families to move to this town when people were coming coming over from the caribbean etc so you know to 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 to, to know that it would have been one of the biggest funerals and and now there's going to be six people there it, it's a really difficult decision that, that, that people are having to make. But um, yeah, I can't even remember what the first part of the question was now, Dean. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's fine. And I guess I, ju I just want to ask you, because we're, we're, we are finishing soon. Um, are you available? Are you still available to shoot funerals during this yeah. time? Is that work that you're taking on? Yeah, I mean, um, because I cover so many different genres, there are genres that are still out there working so for example when all of us are watching the news etc those are journalists that are out there filming getting the pictures etc i am a member of the national union of journalists so i have had jobs jobs to go out and document things so i am still doing that type that type of stuff, fearlessly. Of stuff sorry fearlessly um well like i said earlier there are people that are going to have to go out if everybody stops going out the world stops so even if it might not be you or me if everybody stops going stops going out the world stops doctors have still got to go out train drivers have got to go out people stocking the shops have got to go out um delivery drivers have got to go out there's so many people that still do have to go out so i don't think we can get past that and like i said when we when we're watching the news etc if those people don't go out and capture all of that we don't get any news so all of those things still have to happen 
some of the, the work I've been selling the most during this period, and everyone's going to probably laugh at this, but you know all the pictures of like the empty um, shelves in the supermarket and the queues and stuff? Those are what I'm making the most money from at the moment because all the newspapers and all the magazines and all the TV channels are buying those pictures to include in their reports. So all of those things in terms of that aspect of my work are still happening. So um, if somebody does commission me to shoot a funeral, I'm, I'm still going to do that. For me, that's a massive honour because, you know, especially during this, this period to be able to kind of be the person that ensures that the, the rest of the family do have um, an experience where they can kind of as much as possible be at that loved one's, you know, last journey. That's, a, that's actually a, a massive honour. Um, I don't see it as any different, like I said, to all the people that have to go out on a regular without even thinking about it. When we think about everyone, everyone's at the moment is fixated on um, nurses and the NHS, and I totally get that. But um, I was talking to my partner about it the other day. I was saying that, like, in the supermarket, the supermarket, the people who are working in the supermarket, they don't have any PPE, they don't have any, you know, they're not wearing masks, they're not wearing gloves, etc. But yet, they must be passing by hundreds of people per day, per day. And if they don't turn up at work, we all starve. So there are lots and lots of people that are still doing what they need to do in order to, for, for things to keep, you know, in order for the, the wheel to keep turning. Thank you, Denise. Listen, we are within the last uh, 10 minutes of this conversation. It really does fly. Um, Yemi. Uh, some yeah. Saritha Murray, who's actually a friend of mine, she's in the comments. She said, uh, in the US, apparently, there's no funerals whatsoever. Like, funerals have stopped. So can we just get your quick comment on that and also your, yeah. your, final, your final thoughts for this session? Then we'll take a final thought from each speaker, and then we can wrap up. Yes, that's absolutely true. Funerals in most synagogues, churches, have been um, suspended indefinitely. Um, what's happening is that some people are actually being either kept in cold storage or they are being buried temporarily in mass graves and then they will be reinterred at a later date. So when um, Denise was, you know, you get used to this thing so quickly that I'm actually shocked people are still going to funeral because unfortunately some people went to a funeral, there were I think 26 people and 17 of them caught coronavirus and a couple of them have died. So that's why it's happening. Um, I, and what this is happening, what is, what's happening with me is I'm getting quite close to my friends. I've downloaded House Party. If anybody hasn't done that, do that because that way you and your relatives can get together or your friends um, and you can, um, you know, you can chat and you can see each other. So p friends that I just used to take for granted and maybe send a text, we're actually calling each other or FaceTiming. And that way you feel closer. So you're isolated, but you are still, you can still see each other. So that's the way to, to keep positive. I'll say to people, download as mo mo those things where a lot of your relatives in different countries can come together and just support and uplift one, one another. And thank you for inviting me on, on this call. Thank you so much, Yemi. Just before we take the next person, just want to let everyone know on this call that all of the socials of every um, panelist today is in the comments now. So if you want to connect with any of our uh, speakers here on social media, uh, Joseph has just put all of their hands uh, in, into the comments. Uh, so next, uh, Magali, let's take your final comments, please. Um, final comments is we'll make it through. And, um, you know, it's unfortunately something that's happened to us, but it's going to make it's going to make us stronger if we decide to learn from it. Um, and I think, you know, it's just be there. Let's be there for each other. Let's take things seriously. Um, COVID-19 is serious um, and it's really affecting um, people's health. Um, so it's just to be mindful, you know, let's be let's stay safe um, and encourage others around us to stay safe as well. That'll be my final thoughts. And thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you for being on. And actually, and organising your children to go out on a bike ride at the same time. Yeah, just they're so back. You, just, so have, <laughs> just so you can have the time to yourself. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Denise, you go next. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, first I'd like to start with thanking you as well. Um, that we're finishing just in time because I can see the sun's changing in my living room. Can, can you see the sun? Literally, when it was about to start coming across me, so just in time. Um, I didn't quite, I, I, I wasn't quite kind of up to speed on what, what this, this chat would be about, so I was a bit unsure. So I was firing lots of questions at Dean. I'm sure he was getting very irritated with lots of WhatsApp messages from me. But it's been really useful and it's been really, it's actually been enjoyable kind of thing. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'd say to people to just be mindful of not forgetting how fortunate we actually are. Like there are lots of people that are in so much worse situations. Um, we were at Asda the other day and we saw a man running away from security with a, with a basket full of shopping. So there are people that have literally got zero money at the moment. Um, and if, if you're not one of those people, if you're one of the people whose, you know, salary has fallen or, you know, um, people have cancelled events, etc., just still be grateful for like the, 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 the privileges that, that we have, the, the place that we live in, that, you know, if, if you've got food in your fridge, if you've got a comfortable home, etc., if you're still able to get in contact with your family members, I'd say just to not forget those things because like, like you said earlier, there are so many people just saying, you know, I'm bored, I'm this, I'm that, etc. And just thinking about all the negatives. I'd just say for all of us to be mindful of all the things that we should actually be look, should be grateful about during the during this time. So um, yeah, that would kind of be my my last my last thing. I mean, sorry, one one last thing to add to that. So simple things like this. I don't live with my son. I haven't lived with him for, for, for many years. He's a grown adult now, but he has moved back in during this period because I don't want him with my mom because I can't trust him to stop in when he's supposed to stop in. So he's been here and for the first time in maybe about 10 years, we've been shopping. He doesn't come, to, he doesn't come shopping with me. He doesn't come to Asda with me, but little things like that have just been so kind of beautiful to kind of reconnect with people in a different way so like somebody else was saying I think Yemi was saying whereas you may text friends previously because you just know that they're always there I also have been doing a lot more um voice calls a lot more um video calls etc I tried to show my dad how to do a video call and I ended up talking to his ear for the whole half an hour <laughs> he didn't get that he had to hold the phone here my dad's quite elderly <laughs> So, you know, things like that, just reconnecting with people and just taking some time to slow everything right down. I think, you know, we need to be grateful for some of those things. That's yes, me. indeed. Now, I can relate to that too. But I'm actually just going to let, because of, of time, I'm just going to let Shola speak now. And obviously, please just let us know what your final words are as a person that's going through this as a wedding planner who's got lots of clients panicking and wants to uh, and are postponed until later in the year next year and also the mother of a daughter who was due to be married on this very day but that's all kind of been taken away for the moment please okay my, my um, final thoughts is possibly my first thought because this morning um i woke up and the alarm said wedding day today two o'clock in Portugal so that sort of made me happy but also made me sort of think ah uh. so during the day I've been thinking oh we would have been doing this now oh we would be doing that now we would have been leaving for the for the um, venue now things like that so it's been a sort of um thoughtful day but um I'm pleased that I'm here um talking to people out there um so it's been quite insightful as well what I would say for getting ourselves ready for the next phase and the next phase will come, this too shall pass, as they say. So for the next phase, it's about getting yourself ready. Um, I had a lot of people, that, one or two people have been asking me, oh, you're going on to the show. Can I ask you, how do you get your next client? Or what do you do about getting um, clients that are willing to pay um, a bit more money? And I said, well, listen to the show and you might be able to get some sight. But what I will say to people is in trying to get yourself ready, there are lots of free courses out there, but there's also some paying courses out there. And, um, and I know um, Dean doesn't know that I'm going to say this, but last year we ran um, a masterclass. And that masterclass, it was the first. And I, and I get people saying, well, it's the first, I don't know what it's going to entail. But I do know that this course was fantastic. I phoned around several people within the group saying that we were 
you know, selling the masterclass. And people gave me some of the most wonderful excuses not to go for a course that's been paid for. And the people that did attend actually got more than they actually bargained for. They learned a lot. The speakers that were there were quality speakers. They spoke from the heart. They gave a lot of insightful information. They gave a lot of clues. In fact, I was sitting at the back thinking, why are they telling all the secrets? But the, the people that attended those courses got a lot of information. Now, what I will say is other people are running courses. And I will say English, European people are running courses costing several thousand pounds. And those courses are full. The one that we were running was not several thousand pounds. And I was begging people to come. Spend some money on yourself to progress yourself. You can't buy experience. That's true. You can't buy experience. You have to live through experience. But you can buy to upgrade yourself, to get yourself mentored, to get yourself into the sort of level of thinking that you want to be. So that's what I would say. Spend some time in um, bigging yourself up, I suppose, but also in educating yourself and training yourself. And if somebody says they're doing a masterclass, and I think, Dean, I think you're doing another one later this year. If anybody calls you and say, come to Dean's masterclass, I would say, do it. That's my thought for today. Thank you so, so, so much for that. I did not, that was not a sponsored message, people. I did not <laughs> pay for that plug. But being family, you know, she's just going to look out for my best interests as well as your best interests. And to be fair, that's what we want to do. We want to look out for each other. And that's why I'm putting this platform together. Um, it doesn't really matter how many people exactly we get on. I just want to try and bring a community together um, for during this time. For a lot of people, you know, before the pandemic, will feel lonely and isolated and after the pandemic they will so i just like to try and bring people together as much as possible and just give some um positivity and if there is a time to invest in yourself it is now i'm not trying to sell necessarily my course or my next course there will be one which you guys will get the information for but just like invest in some learning um seeing a different perspective a different point of view there's so many organizations out there that are giving away free courses right now from like, I've seen people sending me everything from uh, Harvard to um, various universities in, in the UK. So, you know, no pressure to, but if you can, and if, if this is not hitting you as hard as it's hitting some others, then try and level up, try and keep yourself busy, try and keep yourself safe, healthy and sanitized too. And thank you, everyone, for joining me on this call. We will be back again next Saturday with uh, George Dixon, a photo another photographer, but this time from London. Um, Crystal from Just Like Mummies, who does cakes. And we have two more people whose names I can't remember right now, which is not great. But you'll see the, the details on the social media um, if you go to at Elite Vendors. Network. Oh, sorry, it's Becky from Becky's Catering too, and we have DJ Miltray. That's it. Sorry, DJ Miltray, Becky from Becky's Catering, George Dixon Photography, and um, also Crystal from Just Like Mummies. So thank you so 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 much, everyone. Please interact with our panelists on their social media, and everyone, please go out, get your exercise. Don't stay out too long. Don't go out if you don't need to, and. Um, just stay, stay as safe as you can because it is getting very serious out there. All right? So have a good day. I'll be back next week with a better ring light, with a bit better lighting. <laughs> and hopefully my beard has grown back a bit as well so I don't look so crazy. But I might, I might need to wear a hat next week though. But yeah, all right, guys, have a good afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.